The planet's magnetic field serves to protect all life on Earth. It protects us all from the infrared radiation which would be constantly pelting us were it not for the Van Allen radiation belts generated by the field. When an evolutionist talks about their millions and billions of years, they seem to forget that the magnetic field is steadily decreasing, which infers that it was even stronger in the past. At its current rate of decrease, Earth would have been uninhabitable just 10,000 years ago. The temperatures alone would have killed us all and melted the crust of the Earth. This does not leave much time for molecule-to-man evolution. It looks like the whole debate can be settled by this one very simple concept. I had to investigate. For roughly a thousand years, mariners have used magnetism by reading compasses for navigation. Even as early as the 1700s, they were quite aware that the strength of the magnetic field fluctuated from time to time and even from place to place. At the center of our planet Earth is a super hot, super dense core of metal, mostly iron. When the creationist argument was first proposed, it was thought that as the Earth spins, its core generates a magnetic field which surrounds the planet. This would seem obvious with a minimal amount of scientific knowledge, but there were a number of factors, such as the change in movement and intensity of the field which this idea couldn't account for. From 1946 to 1947, Nobel Prize winning physicist Walter Elsasser published a series of papers better explaining the origin of the magnetic field. Elsasser proposed that convection currents in the planet's liquid interior were responsible for both the magnetic field as well as its tendency to fluctuate. This concept is known as a dynamo. In addition to variances in intensity, the Earth's magnetic field also moves. Its north and south pole have moved considerably over time, albeit at a slow enough rate that they are still useful for navigation. This again is only explained by the convection currents in Earth's interior predicted by the dynamo theory. These changes in the magnetic field are apparent in igneous rocks, most specifically basalts. When lava is ejected, notably around ocean ridges, it is in a molten form containing a variety of minerals, including magnetic iron oxides. When the lava cools, what is known as the magnetic moment is frozen into the rock. As the seafloor continues to spread, there are new lava flows resulting in new basalts, which progressively record these magnetic moments. A field of study called magnetostratigraphy is concerned with making a complete record of these magnetic moments and forming a history of magnetic changes over the life of the planet. The combined efforts of thousands of studies have shown that there have been multiple fluctuations in the magnetic field and even full reversals. Starting around 1996, Andrew Jackson, Art Jonkers, and Matthew Walker assembled unpublished magnetic records from four centuries of nautical logs. Based on these measurements, the trio were able to see a pattern of decrease over the past 400 years. The magnetic field has, apparently, been losing strength at an average rate of 6.3% per century, with the greatest amount of decrease in the past 150 years being a total of 10-15%. to 15%. The first 250 years show a slightly slower decrease. This was published in 2000 by the Royal Society. Before 400 years ago, the rate of decay seems to be much slower, as basalts from 1,000 years ago show that the field was only 35% stronger than it is today. In fact, we can look at older and older samples of basalt and see that over millennia, the magnetic field has variously gotten weaker and stronger, even to the point of actually flipping as it last did around 900,000 years ago. It is at this point that I address the creationist argument, because as it turns out, there are actually two versions of it. Creation Science Evangelism, Answers in Genesis, and the Institute for Creation Research have published a chart showing a steady decline of the magnetic field going back 10,000 years. As you can see, there is no fluctuation shown at all. As we've already seen, this is inaccurate just by what we know from recorded history. Creation.com and even the Institute for Creation Research have also published this chart, which is based on paleomagnetic readings over the last 4,000 years, as well as a few unsighted measurements to fill in gaps at strategic locations in the chart. While the scholarship of this chart is questionable, it does, however, acknowledge that there have been fluctuations and reversals in the past. Beside a religious bias, the two creationist arguments have one major thing in common, a refusal to accept the paleomagnetic evidence. The former is a refusal to look at any of it, while the latter is just a refusal to look at most of it. This is some denial, considering that paleomagnetic measurements over the past decade have dated back at least 3.45 billion years. This culminated in a July 2015 article in Science by John Tarduno. 
a geophysicist at the University of Rochester. He observed the magnetic moments in zircons bearing magnetic inclusions from the Jack Hills conglomerate in Western Australia. He discovered that the magnetic field was already present at 4.3 billion years ago. This not only establishes a magnetic field from Earth's origin, it also establishes the possibility of plate tectonics even then. It is a game changer. There is another twist here, and that would be the temperatures associated with such an increase in magnetism. To begin with, the temperatures necessary to melt the surface of the Earth are exponential compared to the temperatures we see today. In fact, we see no differential in temperatures resulting from magnetism at the poles where the magnetic field interacts directly with Arctic snow. This creationist argument stems from an antiquated understanding of electromagnetism. While there may be some degree to which the flow of electrons can affect worldwide temperatures, even at their streams, they would have nearly no noticeable effect. The key to understanding how scientists arrive at their conclusions lies in understanding the methodology by which their measurements are taken. You may question their accuracy, but their consistency is undeniable. And that's just another example of how creationism taught me real science. Learn more about the real science behind other creationist arguments by watching other episodes. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may be the subject of a later video. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.